What's up guys, today we're going to be countering the most dangerous chess opening, the King's Gambit. It has the highest win rate for white and it is no wonder because there are a lot of traps, it is the most aggressive variation for white and there are so many attacking opportunities and ways for white to win the game easily. You need to be extremely careful because your opponents who play the King's Gambit over and over again certainly are well familiar with this territory while it can easily catch you off guard. So what do you do against this? I recommend the Folk Beer Counter Gambit. Named after the Austrian master Folk Beer, with a nice sense of humor, he was born in Brno. And your attempt here basically is to turn the situation upside down. You want to be playing the gambit yourself and you want to become the attacker and force your opponent to be a defender. Now, at this point, naturally White has a choice between capturing this pawn over here or this pawn. And here's a cool part. One of these moves lose the game on the spot. And that is a move pawn takes e5. Moreover, the great thing about this variation is that white has an opportunity to make this blunder right now or during one of the following moves, which increases your likelihood of winning the game straight away within the first couple moves. Now, what's wrong with capturing this pawn on e5? We'll get to the main line in a moment, but let's first just clear this off the way. It loses due to queen h4 check, which also attacks this pawn on e4, and now white's in trouble. Basically, they need to do something about their king, either to block the diagonal or to move the king forward, but both ways are equally bad. If they move the king forward, now it's pretty clear what's wrong with this move, right? The bone cloud in a worsened vari variation of that. Now, queen takes e4 is pretty straightforward. You just attack their vulnerable king with all the pieces that you have, and you're gonna checkmate it pretty quickly in a line, for example, like this, bishop f2, and it's gonna be a checkmate. An alternative and the most played solution for white is to play pawn g3, but here you come up with one more double attack. Queen takes e4 this time, hitting their king and the rook in the corner. And after they cover their king anyhow, you then happily grab that rook in the corner, and now you have a totally winning position. Your upper rook and you actually keep attacking. Now, I know that some people always ask me in comments to show things till the end so that you know for sure how to convert it till a complete victory, so let me do that. Now, you attack the knight, you're gonna move it. After this, you can play bishop g4, pinning the knight down to the queen and attacking it once again, because now we have two attackers. And white is really in trouble. They can't move the knight or else their queen will be captured. They also can't defend it by the bishop because the bishop is pinned to the king. You're literally over pinned them all over the place. Therefore, they have to play quite an ugly move, king to f2, just to guard this knight on f3. And to this, you can respond with one more attacking move, bishop c5 check, which again puts them in big trouble. The, knight, the king cannot go back, that would drop the knight. If they go d4, you can just capture it. The knight is still pinned, therefore it cannot capture a bishop, that would drop the queen again. So they have to play something like this, and at this point you could just trade off everything on these squares and go into an endgame with an extra rook, but if you want to be completely, uh, you know, extremely strong in how you act here, you can, instead of trading bishops, you can capture this pawn on b2 and then grab the rook and you totally obliterate them. Having said that, most of your opponents are familiar with this and they're gonna do the right thing. They're gonna capture this pawn on d5. Actually, uh, like about two years ago, I recorded a video about this variation and some white players wrote in comments that they're not afraid of the folk beer counter gambit because they studied it and they know what to do. So we're gonna surprise them once again. Now at this point, what do you do normally? I mean, the main line is pawn e4. Actually, a bit count counterintuitive, but nevertheless, that's the main line. Alternative black could capture this pawn or this pawn on d5, and that's what people usually play in this position. However, we're gonna surprise white once again by playing pawn c6. We insist on playing in the gambit style, wanna speed up our development and start attacking. Plus, we give them one more chance to go into the wrong direction and to capture this pawn on e5. It is still wrong for the same reason queen h4 check, all the same as we have just discussed previously. They go g3, you slide over to e4, and then you double attack the king and rook and win the game. Therefore, this capture on e5 basically is always a big blunder for white, which loses the game. Therefore, at this point, they're likely to capture this pawn on c6. Now, at this point, some of the spectators may suspect that none of you actually learned how chess pieces move, and you refute that assumption by bringing your knight out. Knight takes c6. Here's another fun fact about this. We still keep it possible for them to capture this pawn on e5, which again loses the game. But 
If in the starting position, let me go back here, after f4, d5, only 6% of players capture here on e5, because they know theory, they know that it's the wrong move to play. However, after they capture you go c6, you still give them an option to go wrong, and after this capture, you still give them an option to go wrong once again, and at this point, it is actually the second most played move, which quite ties it with the first most played move, knight to f3, which we're going to talk about. So, it's quite nice, you know, good things come to those who bait. Uh, by the way, what's wrong with pawn takes e5? Man, I guess that you know it by now. It's queen to h4 check, right? And moving the king now is even worse than it was before, even though before it was already pretty bad. <laughs> but now you also have this knight, which can join the party, keep attacking, and the king has to go forward somewhere, and you just keep attacking it, and it's a pretty simple win. By the way, let this be a little tactical warm-up for you. It is black to play, made in two. If you can find it, please write it down in comments below. Here's the problem for white in this position overall. Of course, they may play some other moves. We'll talk about knight of three, the most played move in a moment. But here's the general perspective. Now you have a lead in development. You already have one piece into the game and it's easy for you to bring other pieces. You already control a bunch of lines and diagonals. Your opponent is totally undeveloped. Plus, at any time you can bring your bishop out to c5, control this diagonal, their king is exposed, plus they can never castle because your bishop takes away that square. And that just puts white in big disadvantage. So you're just going to complete your development, and for white they can't ever castle because of your bishop be standing right there, shooting in this direction. Therefore it's quite challenging for white to find the way out of here. The most played move is knight to f3, attack at this pawn again, and it's a useful move to play. It also controls the square on h4 so that you can't ever jump there anymore. And then you play e4 and you keep attacking. Now the knight needs to go somewhere. Knight e5, centralizing the knight, is the most played move and the most natural move to play. We'll talk about that in a second. But again, just so that you have a total understanding of what to do regardless of your opponent's choices. What about knight to g5? Like, first of all, going to this square is not possible. You control it. It's going to be a blunder. What if they go here? Well, temporarily it attacks the pawn, but basically it's a step in, in the wrong direction, because generally in chess you need to bring your pieces towards the center. And here you can play the move knight of 6, guarding the pawn and developing your knight, which you were going to do anyway, and now this knight is just misplaced. You're going to play h6 and kick it back to the edge of the board. Plus, from there, you can also trade it off and totally ruin their pawn structure. If they try bishop c4, uh, sort of the, you know, fried liver attempt in a different situation, here you have a really bold counter. You play bishop g4, you totally ignore this pawn, and you just go bishop g4. Basically, that attacks their queen, and all of a sudden, it turns out that the queen has no way out. There is no escape. And if they want to save their queen, they need to bring the bishop back to e2, which refutes their idea. So bishop c4 turned out to be a waste of time. Now you take it, the queen comes out, and you have another strong follow-up, which is knight to d4. This time you hit the queen as well as this pawn on c2. And if you can actually capture it, it's going to be a fork to his king and rook. Therefore, he really needs to guard the queen as well as this pawn. If they play queen c4, Basically, your position is almost winning already. You just need to be careful not to blunder this sort of scholar's checkmate on f7, but it's easy to stop this, you just guard this pawn. And now you're going to play rook c8, hit the queen, threaten knight, take c2, you want to play h6, kick this knight out, and white is already defenseless. If they castle or do anything, you go rook c8, and actually, it's quite a funny example, because the queen is literally trapped. It has no squares to go to. Like, you control this diagonal, this diagonal, this square, this file, you control everything. Actually, even if the queen could move somewhere, that would still be losing for white, because in that case, you just grab this pawn, and that would grab the rook in the corner. So it's like two times winning for black. <laughs> in most cases, however, they're going to move their knight to the center, and that is okay, you just develop. You don't need to worry about this knight. If they take over here, you recapture, nothing really changed. Again, their biggest problem is their centralized and exposed king, and the fact that you can bring the bishop out and prevent them from castling. Now, they usually play bishop b5, quite a tempting move, an attempt to pin your knight as well as to attack it twice by their knight and bishop. And they expect you to defend it by going bishop d7, but that is a coward move, we're not gonna play that. We're gonna play bishop c5, we're just ignoring them and we're playing our stuff, we wanna be an attacker, right? And we have an agent development, therefore it is totally justified for you to be bold and to attack yourself. Now from here, as we know, the bishop controls this diagonal, making it impossible for him to castle and, generally speaking, setting it up for various attacks of yourself. But of course your opponent will be like, hey, but why can't I just take here and then grab this pawn and then grab the rook, but you're fine with that, because you only live once. You just cover your king, go bishop d7, and now they play a rookie error, they grab the rook, which is already a losing blunder, even though their position was already tough. 
due to the same bishop g4. We have seen this motif before, and all of a sudden this time their queen is literally trapped. There is just no way out for the queen, and there is nothing that could possibly cover the queen. Therefore, you're gonna win it. Now, they also wish to save their bishop. They need to move it somewhere. It's better for them to do it with a check, but you just step it away somewhere. Doesn't matter. Again, this problem persists. So they're gonna be doing something like this. And at the end of the day, you won their queen, but it's not even the main problem of your opponent, because they have some material compensation for the queen. But their main problem is, again, their exposed king which can never castle. You already threatened some sort of bishop f2 checks or, you know, queen d4. So basically you keep attacking queen h4 check maybe or queen b6. You can attack them from different angles and they're mostly undeveloped and their king is exposed. That's their biggest problem. Therefore, that is already winning for black. For example, if they try to grab this pawn, you can continue with knight f2 and once again you destroyed everything they had. What I love the most about this variation is that ultimately you successfully turned their king's gambit into the queen's gambit. And of course, I know that some of you guys will ask me in comments what if my opponent plays some other old moves which we didn't talk about today or does not play the king's gambit or doesn't play chess, what do I do then? Well, head to this free masterclass up there where I'll share with you how to improve a chess regardless of that.